So today we're going to continue on with the endocrine system and a couple of other structures that contribute hormones to our system. One of those is the ovary. So um, <laughs> my friend, she gets like about once a month, she gets really upset about her boyfriend. She's like, I'm going to break up. And, and she's just, it gets, you know, really upset. And I just tell her, well, maybe you're overreacting. <laughs> you get it? Overreacting. <laughs> okay, I was looking up jokes this morning, and that's the only one I could come up with about the ovary. Anyhow, the ovary has a couple of functions. One, of course, is to produce uh, ova, eggs. Hence the name ovary. And the other is to produce hormones. And the hormones are quite involved in the reproductive system of the female. This is an ovary. It's a spongy kind of organ. It's very small. And it's aligned with follicles. And the follicles contain ova, eggs. And that the, the ovary, if you ever see it, um, a micrograph of it or an, a specimen is very bumpy looking. And that's because of the follicles, because the follicles create these bumps on the surface, particularly when they start to develop. So this is an, this is an exaggerated view of one of the follicles developing. When we get to the reproductive system, we'll talk about how more than one develops um, a month, but only one is ovulated. And part of the growth of the egg involves also growth of the follicle. The egg is inside the ovum, singular. The follicle is lined with what are known as granulosa cells. And that is the source of estrogen and progesterone. Ovulation occurs uh, usually once a month. And when the follicle has released the ovum, then it becomes another structure known as the corpus luteum. That will stick around for about three months, releasing hormones if there is pregnancy. If there is not pregnancy, then it will disintegrate. Uh, one second. I can't seem to add something right at the moment. Let me just figure that out. Second in the brain system. There we go. So, the ovary. The ovary and hormones. The granulosa cells that are in the wall of the follicle produce uh, estriodol. Estriodol is one of the estrogens. So there's three estrogens and this is estriodol. Uh, in the first half, of the menstrual cycle. The next structure to produce hormones is the corpus luteum. It's the follicle developing into the structure after ovulation. It also produces estriodol and progesterone. to steroid hormones. So with pregnancy, this will continue 
for approximately eight to 12 weeks before the placenta takes over producing some of their own hormones. And the functions of estradiol and progesterone are development of the female reproductive system. The female reproductive system. Yeah, including, including bone growth. So that's one function. Another is to regulate the menstrual cycle. And maintain pregnancy. So to maintain pregnancy, the, the um, endometrial layer of the uterine wall needs to continue to exist and to grow and to provide somewhere where the embryo can implant. And we're going over those details with the female reproductive system. And preparing the mammary glands for lactation. The ovaries. What about the testes? Also an endocrine gland because the testes produce not only sperm, but also testosterone. The structure of the testes, testes is such that there are uh, meters and meters of seminiferous tubule. So this is a cross section of a seminiferous tubule and sperm is produced in the walls of the tubule. And we'll get into that spermatogenesis and oogenesis with the reproductive system. But for now, we're looking at two different cells, a sustentacular cell, and that's instrumental in helping the sperm to uh, be produced. Um, there are some future sperm cells there and also interstitial cells that are the source of testosterone. Interstitial cells are smaller. They used to be called Leydig cells, I think. Structures aren't called named after people as much anymore. Those kinds of things have been dropped. Interstitial cells. So they're they're um, they produce sorry produce testosterone and estrogen. And estrogen later will get converted to uh, testosterone. Um, and the hypothalamus, which encourages sex drive. So the functions of testosterone is the development of the male body and physique. Sperm production. And sex drive or libido. 
the sustentacular cells do have, um, they do have a function to modulate this process. And they produce a hormone called inhibitin, in, inhibin. Most of the hormone cycles in our body are regulated by some kind of feedback. Inhibin is one of those hormones. It suppresses from the pituitary follicle stimulating hormone and that stabilizes sperm reproduction rates. Yeah, so just how much sperm is produced? Well, um, 300,000 sperm per minute. Seems like a lot. It is a lot. Females, on the other hand, we are uh, carrying about 1.5 million eggs in follicles at birth. And then toward puberty, there are approximately 400,000 of those eggs left. And since every month about 25 or 27 of them uh, start to develop, there is a limited supply. So eggs, eggs are expensive and sperm is cheap. <laughs> That's why females in an animalia and in plants as well, the females of any species tend to protect their eggs except from the most uh, um, promising male. What about other organs? The heart, for example. The heart releases a hormone known as the atrial natriuretic peptide. And it's released when there's an increase in blood pressure. So what it does is it decreases blood volume and blood pressure. So the way it does that is by increasing sodium loss in the kidneys. And when sodium goes across the plasma membrane, water follows it. So water is lost by the kidneys and that decreases blood volume. Um, the skin produces keratinocytes. Keratinocytes are the cells that produce keratin. And these keratinocytes produce D3, vitamin D. But it's that just the first step. So the first step, um, it's converted a couple of times converted a couple of times. So it's the liver that is involved and also the kidneys, which I'll talk about shortly. But the liver converts vitamin D3 to calcidiol. The liver also is a source of insulin-like growth factor that works with the growth hormone. Uh, the liver excretes about 15% of what's known as erythropoietin, uh, EPO. And it secretes angiotensinogen, a prohormone. And I'd like to talk about that a little bit more. It's a precursor of angiotensin II, a vasoconstrictor. So I'd like to talk about that in the context of uh, COVID because it's quite important. Um, so just firstly, erythropoietin, erythro. 
electro P O I E 10 stimulates bone marrow to produce red blood cells. RBCs. Yeah, uh, it's triggered by a drop in oxygen in the system, an increase of carbon dioxide. Um, so angiotensinogen is a precursor of angiotensin 1. So there's two conversions before it becomes angiotensin 2. Convert it to angiotensin 1 by a kidney enzyme. called renin. And then angiotensin 1, I don't know what the abbreviation is for angiotensin. It's converted to angiotensin 2 in the lungs. By an enzyme called angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE. Very apt name. The function of angiotensin 2 stimulates blood vessel constriction, vasoconstriction, and aldosterone secretion. The effect of that is to raise blood pressure. You know, when you constrict blood vessels, you raise the pressure. It's just like a hose when you're, when you're um, watering the lawn. If you constrict the nozzle of the hose, there will be more pressure and the water will shoot out further. So it increases blood pressure, and, it, and this whole system is in response to a decrease in blood pressure. But there is a check and balance to this system so that the blood pressure uh, doesn't remain so high, and that is with ACE2, is another enzyme. I believe it is also in the lungs. Um, ACE2, an enzyme which causes degradation of angiotensin 2. And thereby counters its effect. And you're like, what does this have to do with COVID, Maria? <laughs> well, it just so happens that angiotensin 2 is the entry point of uh, COVID. So it enters the lung. It is in the lungs. It enters the lungs through this receptor.
And I suppose the first thing you really think about, well, why don't you just block it, you know, with drugs or something, and then the um, COVID can't get in. But of course, then you're also, um, the other effect would be to leave the blood pressure up all the time, which can lead to heart failure, of course. So that is not a good way to make a vaccine. What about the kidneys? So the kidneys convert calcidiol, we're back to vitamin D now, calcidiol to calcitriol. And it is the active form of vitamin D. So um, it increases calcium absorption by the intestine and inhibits loss of calcium in urine. And therefore it makes calcium available for bone deposition. So vitamin D. But vitamin D also has some other interesting qualities, uh, which is becoming more and more um, evident by various, various studies, mostly observational studies. I think there's only been one clinical study, but it does look like um, very strong evidence that it enhances immune peptides. And um, it has some other antiviral effects. For example, it disrupts uh, the virus um, envelope. I don't really know the, the mechanism by which this works, but I have it on fairly good authority that this is, there is evidence for this. Okay, what else does a kidney do? The kidney also produces 85% of erythropoietin that stimulates red blood cells. Um, it also is instrumental in converting angiotensinogen to angiotensin one. The stomach and the small intestines, well, they, all, they have an enteric nervous system. They also have their own enteric uh, hormonal system that coordinates uh, digestive motility or peristalsis and secretion of digestive enzymes. The placenta, another uh, structure very instrumental in endocrine secretion, it secretes estrogen and progesterone and some other um, hormones, it regulates pregnancy. So this is, this is after uh, the corpus luteum has um, inv involuted. So in this case, the placenta takes over with the production of estrogen and progesterone and stimulates development of the fetus and mammary glands. Now, what you may ask are all these hormones made of? Uh, not very dissimilar to neurotransmitters. And some as indeed, as we saw before, some neurotransmitters also function as hormones. So there are, for example, steroids. Those are lipids. All steroid hormones are derived from cholesterol. So you do need cholesterol in your um, diet. I'm just going to admit two people here. You need cholesterol in yeah. your diet for these things. Uh, you can have an overabundance of cholesterol, of course, but um, there are reasons for that. You do need to have them for synthesis of the sex steroids and the corticosteroids. Uh, peptides and glycoproteins are also hormones. Um, oxytocin, for example, uh, ADH, antidiuretic hormone. Um, all the releasing and inhibiting hormones of the hypothalamus and most of the anterior pituitary hormones as well. And you don't have to remember uh, all of the hormones that are a specific structure, but you need to know that uh, there are different uh, molecules that act as hormones. And that's because depending on whether they're hydrophobic or hydrophilic, they're going to have a different kind of effect. 
or a, a rather not a different kind of effect, but a different way of causing their effects. Yeah, so there's uh, oxytocin, antidiuretic hormone. Look how close they are in structure. Very close in structure. What's the only difference? Let's see. This is, um, this is isoleucine there, and that's phenylalanine there. And this is leucine here, and that's arginine there. Uh, those are the only difference in those hormone structures. And man, they have quite a different effect on the body. Monoamines are derived from amino acids and include things like uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine and dopamine, which are catecholamines and thyroid hormones. So I'd like to just look at uh, hormone synthesis, the steroid hormones, quite interesting. It all starts with cholesterol and then enzymes convert cholesterol to progesterone first. And then depending on the cells, the situation and the signals, uh, progesterone gets converted either into testosterone or cortisol or hydrocortisone or aldosterone. Yeah, and then testosterone is converted into estriodol. Some steroids are peptides. Yeah, so they're, they're made in the rough endoplasmic reticulum, just like all peptides are. Uh, insulin, for example, here's insulin with a couple of strong disulfide bridges here that maintain its shape. Um, and it's converted from pro-insulin and split in two places. So you actually get two, two hormones from one structure. Pro-insulin, you get C-peptide and insulin. Yeah, so pro-insulin is converted in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And C-peptide has its own hormone effects. Um, the monoamines, they're all synthesized from tyrosine. except for melatonin. I believe it is the same. Uh, renin is the enzyme that makes cheese. I think so. Melatonin is synthesized from tryptophan. And there's this, it's a myth that uh, tryptophan, because it's converted to melatonin, makes you sleepy after you have turkey <laughs> at uh, Thanksgiving or Christmas. But really, you're getting sleepy because you just ate an enormous amount of food. Because <laughs> you had a lot of carbs as well when you were, when you were eating your meals. Yeah, so the thyroid hormone. And we had a good poster of the thyroid. The thyroid hormone is composed of two tyrosine molecules. And it does require a mineral, of course. What is that mineral? What mineral does the thyroid require? Iodine, good. And our salt in Canada has been iodized since like 1945 or something. So a lot of countries have iodized salt so you don't lack iodine in your diet. So I'm going to skip over thyroid hormone synthesis because it is complicated, it looks complicated and it doesn't add that much to the value of knowing about the function of the thyroid. But let's see about hormone transfer. So I'm gonna to skip to hormone transport and then I'm going to uh, stop this lecture for a break. Um, so as we know, 
molecules have different properties. Hormones have different properties. They can be uh, polar or nonpolar. Um, if they're polar, they're hydrophilic. If they're nonpolar, they're hydrophobic. So monoamines and peptides are hydrophilic. They mix easily with the blood plasma, but as you can imagine, the steroids and the thyroid are hydrophobic. So they would just clump up in the blood if they weren't transported separately by transport proteins. And those transport proteins are in blood plasma. So a bound protein is one that's bound, or sorry, a bound hormone is bound to a transport protein. The hormone is attached to a transport protein. And the transport protein is in the blood plasma, but only an unbound protein can leave a capillary. Sorry, an unbound hormone can leave the capillary. So it must detach before it leaves the capillary. And once it does that, its half-life is just a few minutes. But since it's released very close to its target cells, uh, that is not usually a problem. A bound hormone um, increases the half-life. A bound hormone has an increased half-life. That's the amount of time it takes for half of the hormone to be excreted from the body. And the transport proteins are such things as albumin, uh, globulins, Aldosterone doesn't have a, a transport hormone, although it's a steroid. Its half-life is very short. It's only 20 minutes. So uh, aldosterone. So once it's excreted, within 20 minutes, it must bind to receptors. And aldosterone is instrumental in uh, salt and water retention. So I think I'd like to end this part of the lecture here before we go on. All right.